Are you guys rolling? Yes, um, at any given time? Okay. Uba no camera three. Oh. I want to talk to the people as a two, <laughs> as a two shot. Will you be able to speak to the people? Yeah, yeah. Need to No vote, la ba. No vote, but Satan is on his camera. Mr. Maimani, I would like to officially welcome you to the panel show. This is uh, officially our second sit down, and unfortunately, because you are so busy. And it's a crazy time that we're shooting. I think it's in the week of bricks. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and just focus on some of the questions I wanted to ask you. And if we can get those out of the way, then we can have a chill us. Maybe for the last 15, 20 minutes. That's How are you sure. doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm strong, Baba. As I, yeah, it's, I'm energized. Yeah. I, I always love a good fight. And I feel like we're in the ring, man. And uh, we're fighting hard. So, so I'm feeling good and strong. Yeah. Let's hit it. Build one South Africa, Bosa. Mm. Mm. Um, for people that don't know what that is, what is that? Because people still are like, no, but Musi should be running in the DA. It's like, Baba, he's gone. Sure. What is Build One South Africa and what should we... I mean, Build One South Africa is the fastest growing political party in the country, right? We launched last year and our primary interest was exactly that. We have a vision to say, can we build South Africa 2.0? Let's mm. let's recognize that South Africa finds itself now in a space where it's old, it's governed by old people, it's time for change. So let's build, let's build a working country mm. because at this point in time, things aren't working. Yeah. Lights aren't on, whatever. Yeah. Let's build a working country. So now number two, we said to ourselves, let's focus on issues such as the economy, education, the sense of safety for mm. people. So we've got a strong message that focuses on that. But part of our USP is that we've gone out and said, South Africans who want to go represent other South Africans in parliament, let them put out their names there. Yeah. And we put out an application, we put out a process, 450 odd people applied. Uh, we've whittled them down to 200 for, 200 for national, 200 for provincial. And we unveiled the first 24. I'm telling you now, it's probably one of the most talented caucus mm. I've ever seen. You had people with degrees, you had people for the first time, and it's diverse, it's black people, white people, Indian people, colored people. So we wanted to bring communities on board. Deadly, we're that party that says to ourselves, we want to play, you know, for those who follow football, we talk about Champions League, the top four teams. Mm. Because at the top, it's said that the first three parties are all in decline, the government and the opposition. Mm. So uh, let's come in there. Let's build with South Africans who share values, talk to young people, and ensure we, we rattle this cage and bring change. So I'm running. I'm running for president next year. And I'm asking South Africans, get behind. Let's get going. You are part of the official opposition. Hmm. Um, we haven't really heard much about that, um, or at least for people that are not involved heavily in politics. Hmm. Officially on the record, why did you leave the Democratic Alliance and what is your feeling around them as a party today? Yeah, let's, let's, I'm going to give you the full version because I don't want, I, I, I want you to know why. Sure. When I joined the DR, I joined because I always wanted a party that delivers and I wanted a party that works for all South Africans. Okay. I was very intentional about that. We said once in a, in a strat session, and we recognize that if you build a party for all South Africans, right, which other people say as a hypothesis that may not necessarily work, mm. but I still believe in it. It's worth fighting for. We knew back then, Nuguti, you would lose on some black South Africans who say, I'm, I'm not going to work with a party that's got white people in it. Sure. We knew we'd lose some white South Africans who say, I'm not going to be in a party with black South Africans in it. But it was an important fight to have. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, we had an incredible breakthrough election. You'll remember we governed four metros. We were growing because South Africans of all races were coming on board. Mm -hmm. In fact, in 2014, we had incredibly high numbers in Gauteng. I ran that campaign, not on the back of anything else, but asking people to believe and work together. Sure. So we saw the fruit of that vision that says, let's bring South Africans together. And then more and more, I started to get this feeling that there was a group of South Africans that saw that the organization was changing to represent more people that made them uncomfortable. They started to fear for their own selves. 
I was accused after the 2016 election when we had councillors who came from Nelson Mandela Metro, Metro University that started to say, no, I gave these young people answers so that they can be put higher up in the list. You started to have this backlash of people saying, no, 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 no. You must be in some way or another an acceptable black so that you can operate in the same way like this. I fought because I strongly believed in an organization that works for everybody. And I knew, Guti, by 2019, we could never go to parliament with a list for South Africans that was, if you like, monoracial. I mm. couldn't take a, a caucus to the National Assembly that said it was just a whole bunch of white males or whatever the thing is. 2019 was a unique election. You'll remember it was just soon after Zuma. Mm. President Ramaphosa was coming on board. And what we foresaw when I, we first strategized over a long period of time, we saw just under 200,000 white South Africans move towards the Freedom Front Plus. Mm, that is true. Yeah. And no leader wants to lose votes. No, no one. Mm. So I said, let's understand what the dilemma is. I framed some of the questions to say, let's understand as much as those 200,000 voters have gone that way, but how is it that after two decades of government in the Western Cape and in the city of Cape Town, black South Africans who are living in Kailicha and places like that are not themselves voting in their numbers for the DA? Because we must interrogate issues. Mm. So then it became more and more that given that climate, there were some who were saying, we want our thing back. Sifun hmm. into Make, make the DA great again. And then <laughs> there was a strong move to say what we're actually going to do now is to go after those 200,000 and bring them back and effectively adopt a few things. Mm. The first is let's be colorblind. You know, as much as I believe in Sometimes the out of context quote by Martin Luther King that says they shall be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skins. They forget that the context of the speech, I have a dream, included a whole lot of reparations and an addressing of issues that pertained to African-Americans. There was an identification yeah. of race in that so that we can achieve that vision. Propaganda is always uh, yeah. convenient. Correct. So there were some who just kind of took this color blindness which for many South Africans, particularly black South Africans, there's, an, there's a feeling that says when you adopt that position, you also adopt a position that can make you sometimes racism blind. Mm. You also adopt a position that says you can't see there was an injustice committed against black people. Mm. So we had this dilemma. I believe strongly that it wouldn't have been correct for us to pursue the the voters who had left. And yeah. people try to use language. We had to continue on the pathway of building a party for all South Africans. Yeah. Some felt, no, that wasn't the vision. So we had a divergence immediately. And it had implications. Mm. Suddenly you had a number of donors that say, no, 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 no. We want to fund a colorblind, minority-focused organization. Straight up, saying that then straight there up. Were other people who then started to pursue, they knew, they knew they couldn't win at Congress. Mm. As popular amongst the delegates, as popular amongst the citizens, still am and still love the people that of this correct. country, including many of the people inside the DA. Even in other parties, sorry, correct. just to get in there, there are a lot of people that outside of the DA really, really are mm. huge fans of you. Yeah. And... And so they knew they couldn't, and so they started to make my life a complete misery. Mm. I'd wake up on certain days and read stories about myself in newspapers that were complete distortions. Mm. And it made, became hard. I started to despise going to work. Mm. It was a calculated move to work me out. Sure. And as much as we sought to fight, I looked at other leaders, particularly black leaders who had suffered the same, had been kicked out. Mm. It's not typically that we fire you. It's just that we make your life incredibly sure. hard. So I had to make this one decision. Do I believe in becoming a minority party? No, mm. I don't. Do I believe in the message of fight back? No, I don't. 
And ultimately, will I serve South Africa better by seeking reform so that our politics don't become majority parties versus minority parties or black parties versus white parties mm -hmm. or regional parties? It's when I said, I don't believe the, v the DA is the vehicle yeah. to bring about that change. Do I count it a privilege to have served inside the DA? Of course. It gave me an opportunity to be in parliament to fight for the things I wanted to fight for. Mm -hmm. I hold no resentment, no grudge towards them. But at the same time as that, it becomes important when I talk about this vision of building one South Africa that I have to pursue it. Mm. It was untenable. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I learned I would never want to put a South African in a position where they would feel some of the things that we went through. There were really calculated things that would dehumanize you. And that's why when people eventually came up with statements like my money was an experiment, you do realize how patronizing, how degrading mm. that language is from the very people who you're working with. So when it's said and done, we learned, we saw what worked, we saw what didn't work, and we want to build a government and a political movement that does not replicate that. The DA lost Lindy Omazibu. They lost Pumzile Fantam. Herman Mashaba came up, and I'm raising him now as well because he was almost highlighting that the, the DA has an issue with you being liked, almost outside of the DA. Mm. So my question to you is, and it's unfair, and you don't have to answer it. Do you believe the DA is a, is a racist party and has a racist framework? I think it would be incorrect of me to say that a whole organization is racist. Mm. There are South Africans inside the DA who are South Africans who genuinely care about South Africans from different walks of life. Yeah. I worked with some of them, people like Siviwe Khwarube, who still remains within the DA. Mm. And these are South Africans that are great. The difficulty is that the predisposition that makes the DA a minority party and then miscalculation of what Steve Biko said. You know, the dilemma with some liberals is that they think for you to come in, not only must you be assimilated in, but you must be liberal like them. 100%. You create a context upon which the overall predisposition of the organization is that it is off for these people, for this purpose, mm. and all you have to do is come and fit in. Yeah. I can recall having a conversation even with someone like Patricia DeLille saying, at times, you can feel like you are just merely a domestic worker in this place Correct. waiting to bide your time. And therefore, when you are no longer needed, you can be kicked out. These were experiences of people mm. who felt within. So I think, and, and, and it shows, right? It shows in some different ways. When you are comfortable at standing up publicly and saying, come vote, come vote, come vote. Black South Africans come in. Yeah. And then when, when then you have to adjust policies that advanced redress, mm. people suddenly say, no, 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 we don't, we don't, we don't buy those. Yet it is enshrined in the constitution. When I was fighting for diversity inside the deer, mm. a value I championed. Yes. It didn't, in, in, it didn't even, it wasn't in the constitution of the deer, but I wanted to put it in the constitution of the deer because I wanted to make sure that over a long period of time, the DA will never become a party for only minorities. It had to be diverse for the people of South Africa, departing from the constitution of South Africa that says we are united in our diversity. You know, I had to fight. There were people who rejected that whole vision. So call it what you want. I sometimes do think in its natural outlook, it has that minoritism fight back mentality. And I think that whilst I think that will serve a particular purpose, mm. because in the same way as if the Freedom Front Plus sets itself out as a party for African South Africans, mm. then it would be fair and befitting that the DA must be entitled to also be a minority party, as would be the IFP mm. focus in a Zulu party. It's just not my politics. My politics are like, no, 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 no. It is important that people are not united on the basis of biological features, mm. but rather that they share the same ideals and values. 100%. So that is not 
what I'm after. I'm after this vision. That's why I couldn't stay. There's a there's a movie I recommended last time we sat down. I don't know if you ever had a chance to watch it. Uh, if you haven't, I'll I'll reference it again. A movie called Get Out mm. with Daniel Kaluuya. Uh, the premise of the movie is this black guy is dating a white lady. They visit his fa- her family, white family. Later on in the movie, you realize this family runs this experiment where they go around kidnapping black men. They take out their brains and they put in the brains of old white people that are about to die in these black healthy bodies. Do you believe that being called a failed experiment was was that? It was, they were like, here's a young up and coming black guy, speaks very well, positions well, he's got a diverse family. We think if we bring him onto our side, he'll be able to, like in the movie, take on our ideals as old white people and then champion them. But because he looks good, he ticks the right boxes on the outside, he'll be able to push our agenda. Part of that is the first problem. There was sometimes moments when I look at other colleagues who have left. Let me Mm. think about some someone like Zakele Mwango. The now he's in KZN. Mm. If he was even celebrating his own cultural practice, there were sometimes practices where people would say, No, 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 that's not what we are about. So as to strip away your identity as a black South African. Yeah. Now when I look at it today, I, I don't I don't even have to say anything except that you need to just look at the leadership sure. that has been elected now. You need to see that almost in all major councils, only particular races are, are, are leading in those councils. Sure. That's just that's just what it is. So I do think it suffered from from what Biko described, which is what I said. Be sure. liberal like us. We'll call it so, white liberalism. Correct. So yeah. come in and, and be like us in, in that way. And I happen to also furthermore believe that when I look at just you talk about that experiment bit, I just think that's probably one of the most offensive things said about black South Africans. Mm. Um, given, my, given that, especially for people who come from a... Jewish background who could themselves I understand the pernicious nature of what happens when other human beings experiment on others yeah that you have such profound psychological issues so I say that to mean that if there's a deduction that says maybe we run this experiment to what end if you just want black people inside the organization but you're not willing to do the hard yards of addressing the injustices yeah. of black South Africans yeah And to me, this is not a black versus white issue. You are correct. My wife is a white South African. Mm. But the call even upon her is that we have a duty to fight for South Africans who are left out when the majority are black. And you have a duty towards that. This is not black versus white. It's us addressing a systemic exclusion that we've inherited out of apartheid to build a future. Mm. So, 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 So any party that stands up and fails to recognize that in the South African context is either A, being lazy to address the very complex issues of our society, Mm. or it is rejecting the historic mission of saying one day it can be possible that kids can be judged truly by the content of their character rather than the color of their skills. It is so, 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 so to me, I'm never going to shy away from that. It's a historical mission. I'll keep fighting it. And I'm afraid, even when we fought it inside the DA, some people rejected it. They had the power of donors and they had all of that. And so you couldn't stay. That's why we had to fight it from outside. But it's still a mission we must continue to fight. My last two questions on the DA, because I don't want to speak about them here. We're here for Bold on South Africa. Um, how powerful is Helen Zilla, if at all? And then number two is. Do you think the DA is as great a governing party as they claim? Do, they, do you think outside of Bulldog South Africa, they're the best governing party at present? I think for many South Africans, they say, yeah, you guys govern well, but not for people like me, mm. right? And, and, I, and I think the, the stats in Cape Town indicate when you look at sometimes when I go to communities like Kaili Chakukuletu, et cetera. I will, though, say this, and I think that's an important issue. Yeah that for the confidence of the DA, no one wakes up in there with a mission to go steal money. Which is different. It's very different. And it's a significant difference. Yes. Because, and it's an important difference. Mm -hmm. Because 
it's one thing to not govern well for other people. It's yes. quite another to claim you govern well for other people, but frankly, you govern well for nobody and steal the money. 100%. Which I think sometimes is the contestation here. So so I, I do think there is that challenge. But on the issue of Helen Zilla, you know, I feel like there are two versions of Helen Zilla I met. There was a Helen Zilla I knew before she went to Singapore. And this was a woman who recognized redress. In mm -hmm. fact, I can remember sitting with her at a press conference where she said, if you, don't, if you don't recognize black advancement, then you shouldn't be voting for the DA. Here was a woman who was endearing to South Africans in that she even learned how to speak Kosa or worked mm -hmm. at doing that. There were people who would be irritated by her dancing, but I could understand <laughs> that symbolically, here was someone who was saying, we work for all South Africans. And I'm trying. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. Yeah. She then went off to Singapore. I can remember the tweets about colonialism, and this is not the purpose to talk about. Yeah. Mm. But upon return, I think she adopted a posture in a global context that sought to say, well, there's this outrage that's been manufactured against whites. I'm going to create a space where I fight against it which then made it seem as though you were here to defend whites against the whole, mm. which divorced away from whether the conversation about colonialism was hurtful or not. I actually think that if anyone was to be more offended by colonialism, it's white Afrikaners, mm. because it was during colonialism where many uh, white Afrikaners were put in concentration camps. That's correct. So I think once that posture then came into the organization, it then fed into this fight back narrative. Defend minorities. And the book post that, uh, I can't remember, I think she wrote a book called Woke something, I can't remember it, mm. was her way of, in my view, trying to say there's a global move that, and I'm not a wokeist by any matter of means. Sure. But what I will say is that there's always been a universal fight for inclusion of all South Africans and all citizens in the world. There's a genuine confrontation that we built diverse worlds. And I think she thought, well, I must defend. Go, and the prophet stay broke. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah. And, 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 and it, there was a broader alliance, alignment with people like Candace so, and so many that started to speak that kind of language. Mm -hmm that it became, in some ways, the identity of the deer. So in answer to the question, is powerful or not, she's a very strong person. Mm. But I, I have time for her because I, I respect her because I know her views. Yeah. Unlike people who, who have one view publicly and another privately. Sure. Um, and I think the DA in and of itself uh, has had her be able to manage the organization. She's in a very powerful position. Mm. As the chair of the federal council, that's a very strong position. It's, it's, it's in some ways at the equivalent of what would be a secretary general in an ANC type formation yeah. structuring. But it means her influence is profound because it's the one position inside the organization that interacts not only with the professional aspect of the party, which is a massive machine. Mm -hmm. When people talk about the blue machine, it's led from that space, but it's also the same position that interacts with the politics and sets things like congresses up, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. which means naturally leaders that are being elected all across the country then come from there. So it's a very powerful position. And, and in the lobbying for her to come back into that position, it was one of the things that I was like, guys, we have to build a future orientated leadership. And it's not about her personally, but it's about we took a leap. We were building an organization that was diverse, future focused and was growing in communities. Why do we want to be seen as people go backwards? What happened with you and Herman Mashab and why are you not part of Action SA? Herman Mashaba and I left maybe within a couple of days of each other. Mm. I happened to have recruited Herman into the DA because and worked hard for him to be mayor of Joburg. Thank you for that, by the way. One of my favorite mayors we've had. Right now, we don't know what's happening in Joburg, but <laughs> I do miss uh, Itzheimer. 
But because those circumstances happen, does not mean that we should just suddenly start a political party together. Fair. Secondly, I I discuss the issues that from a modus operandi when I speak about BOSA that we must come back to a space where we elect candidates a particular different way. Mm. And I'd argue the case that BOSA will be an organization that heralds itself on the value of Ubuntu. This idea of shared humanity, that mm. I see that you're a human being before any other thing, that we have common threats. Yeah. So I have a struggle with some of the immigration statements that I've heard. You see, to me, immigration and some of the statements that have come out of that are fundamental to the dignity of human beings. So I don't subscribe to an anti-immigrant sentiment. I do subscribe to a theory that says that human beings can be legalized in the country, wherever they are. I subscribe to the view that when you come into South Africa, you need to understand what South African norms, values, culture looks like, and you've got to work within that. The last thing we need is little Lagos or mm. little um, whatever, mm. got to build it. And I think it's hypocritical because we ignore the fact that amongst elites, if you are in the Atlantic seaboard of Cape Town, there are properties not owned by South Africans and South Africans sometimes can't buy those properties because they are competing with foreign currencies. So if we are going to have a progressive immigration policy, it must begin at making sure that we adjudicate on visas quickly, make sure people can come into South Africa, and that we deal with law and order for all citizens. Mm. It's not a popular view. You're not, you're not supporting open borders. That's not what you're saying. No. And you're not I'm, supporting illegal people here. Correct. You're just saying these are human beings. If we're going to speak about managing they are being here illegally or whatever. Let's do let's, it let's, let's, with let's, humanity up front. Let's rather focus internally on the strengthening of home affairs so that people can apply for either refugee status or whatever status they need, or mm. visa and business visas. And we must be effective at how we manage our borders. So that's my stance. You don't believe in deportation? I think it's a, it's, 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 there's an impulse amongst people that wants to see that. I don't think it's realistic. Mm. I think anyone who sits here and says to me, we're going to go around and see mass deportations of people. If, if Naturally, we've got to fix legalization first. Mm. To me, there are so many non-South Africans who have been here for long enough on even things like Z82 forms and many different things that we've got to figure out the best ways that they, 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 they've been integrated into society. Yeah. And for many of those people, I've got South African family already. So who do you deport? Someone is married to a South African. Do you say the wife can stay, but the husband must go? And what happens to the children? But you know what the people are saying on the streets? They're saying the husband must go. He must come back here the right way, but he must go first. The tough bit about leadership. L let me say this. Sure. I lived in Soweto in the 80s, three roads down from a hostel. I used to go to hostels, and when you get the baby boo, Zuguti, Yeah. If you can't speak Zulu, you are not from here. Inle. We, inle. <laughs> we'll deal with you. And this is not to say Zulus are violent or whatever. I'm just describing my lived experience. Yes. Now, how do we then give policing the right now to also run as home affairs and go around into communities and go ask, Ubanwe? Mm. Or ask, can you count in a South African language? Mm. I, I, I think to me, we've got to think hard about how, how we deal with SADC. Mm. We've got to think harder about how we identify citizens and make sure everyone is regularized. And if people who refuse, who reject those options, mm. then fair enough. Then you must deport because it's part of you enforcing your laws. Yeah. But let's not sell South Africans into this belief yeah. That one day a government will come in here and sweep people in trucks and send them away. I can't see it happening. And I also do think that there are questions of human rights that must be looked into this issue. So the issue with Dumasha was more ideological differences. And if ever there was a thought to potentially work together, that might be the issue. 
Is it a mashaba issue? Is it an action SA I, I, issue? I also do think that if it's it's not ideology, it's also practice and principle, right? Yeah. Let's go and build the constituency of South Africans. Let's go do that. Our system allows for a contestation of ideas. Mm. Let's contest for them. Sure. And let's make sure that whatever happens, he's he's part of the moonshot pact, right? Yes. Because there, there's a s- scheme of parties. But it's another league. It's a number of parties there who are going to play. E- e- they've asked for a special league. I don't know if you remember, there was a time... <laughs> In in Europe, one of the one of the, some of the clubs said, "No, we don't want to play Champions League. We'll start our own league." I remember. Was remember it not the, Spanish people or something yeah, that were pushing for that? I remember. Now, that's all that's happened. They've created another league. Right? You're jumping. I wanted to ask you about the Moonshot Pact, but please so continue. now they're going to play against each other and still compete, and then people have to answer. Okay, so if I vote for that one, does that automatically mean I voted for that <laughs> other one? You know. So there's all sorts of these issues. Yeah. I have to go and challenge for younger voters who are interested in new ideas about their future, who say from a policy point of view, let's go. So so at its core, let's not just merge people for the sake of merging. Mm. Let's come up with ideas that sit in the middle and let's go. That's why I'm running. I want to get um, two million young people to come and vote for us and bring about the change next year. And those two young million. people, those young people, have, absolutely. Those young people are not going to wake up in the morning thinking to themselves, uh, actually, for me, I'm interested in the fruit salad that is there. But they historically didn't vote for those parties. Just because you've brought them together under a new league does not necessarily mean they are going to now be enthused about going there. Let's go and find them. They are there. Mm. They are there. Let's talk to them. Your target is two million for next year? We want to grow. We want to grow beyond that. This is my goal. Yeah. We, we got to bring change. What are we playing for? Two million would make you the third biggest party in the country. That's the goal. Okay. We've spoken about Herman Mashaba Action SA. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the smaller parties. Uh, the Freedom Front you've touched on. Uh, the IFP is a, is a big player. I want player. to also and, correct another. And, and the PA, Pinkaton McKenzie, I which is a cor- new player. I want to correct this language. This election is not big versus small. Mm. It's old versus new. This notion that these big parties are solutions... Big party politics have also delivered state capture. Because mm. one party dominance means that. Yeah. Let's come up with new things. Baba, today you and I are doing a podcast. Yeah. My father never did a podcast. Sure. <laughs> so, so, so would you say vinyls are the thing because they are, mm. they've been around? Yeah. No. We adopt new technology. Ah. You and I, are, in some ways, people would look at us and anyone in this room will say, we're too young to be in parliament. Because mm. the parliament is like this place for old people. Yes. we got to fix that. Yeah. We've got to modernize the state and build a digital space. Today, you and I, I don't know about you, but I can't remember when last I went into the bank. Sure. But I've transacted on the bank. Sure. I phoned my bank I, we Zoom, uh, we do, I was with my mother yest- yesterday doing a, 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 a WhatsApp video call with my banker so that we can figure out what we do. <laughs> These are new things. Yeah. But you try today and report, a, go to the home affairs and apply. Some of these practices are sometimes okay. You still have to mm-hmm. appear in person. You try and renew a driver's license. Come on, let's yeah. modernize the state. Yeah. But we're not going to do that if we just simply believe that Old parties, old politicians are going to deliver that. Ask me in Bantu. Let's modernize things uh, and change. Is that one of your selling points for Build On South Africa? That we're, we're futuristic, probably technology driven, and we want new. We're tired of old. Absolutely. It's, it is, and it has to be that way because half the reason Johannesburg, in some ways, faces difficulties is because the infrastructure is old. Yeah. And we haven't spent time thinking about how do we modernize not only infrastructure, but modernize how Joburg works, smart cities of the future. The way we even think about taxation, the way we think about broadband penetration all across. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I I worry when somebody says to me, yes, I was with Oliver Tambo in Morogoro. (laughs) What is that person going to tell us about the metaverse, (laughs) Marban? It's just just not going to happen, right? So let's... Let's be deliberate and intentional about modernizing, being future-focused, because that way 
We start to think about education differently, about blended learning. We start to focus on new industries that are emerging so that we can create jobs in households. We furthermore are able to think, let's think about even just the issue of crime. You know, when I, uh, we, we were leading the coalitions that took over Joburg and Chwane and Kabecha, we were starting to speak to people who are experimenting with technology like Shotstopper that uses ultrasound to figure out where gunshots were coming from so that we can deploy resources appropriately. Th th these are things we ought to be doing so that uh, when you one day want to go report a crime, you know, if you ever, I was in a, a couple of months back, I was in a car accident because someone hit me from the back and so I had to go to the police station. Mm -hmm. You get to the police station, you start to want to report this crime. Yes, buddy, here's a piece of paper, draw the accident. When last Is that you, a real thing? When last did you physically sit and draw a car? Oh, I'm shy, so. <laughs> you, 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 we just, that's what's going on. And I'm going, guys, I'm certain mm. that using technologies like ChatGPT, using ways algorithms, the majority yeah. of affidavits that are put together, particularly in particular crimes, I would make the case that there's p significant parts of it that are significantly the same. Mm -hmm. And then there are issues where they are unique to the crime. Yeah. Let's maximize technology, man. Let's figure out. For, 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 for Women's Day, my wife and I went to a police station to try and figure out how to report rape, which is a common issue. We went to the one of the highest police stations in the Western Cape where rape had was occurring. Mm. We stood in this long line outside. It took us a while to get to the front, which means that in certain instances, if you're a woman, evidence is with every hour that's sure. passing, there are other issues. When we got there, we were treated by a male uh, police officer, mm. which for a woman who's been raped, that could be secondary trauma. Yes we asked to go sit in this room where they literally couldn't interview her and they couldn't find the keys to the room. When asked the question where the rape kits were, they told me that she needed to go to another place which was 20 minutes away and if she didn't have transport, they'd go fetch the person 20 minutes from there and bring them to the police station or to the nearest hospital. Now, if I can transact banking on my phone, could I not figure out the best ways for me to report a crime using technology? And if what was needed was for me to go to the nearest doctor clinic and get a report about any physical harm that I might have suffered as a woman so that we don't, we avoid secondary trauma that occurs from that. It's about using technology to fight a very serious crime in a country. But if you've got a government they're still trying to fix the problems of my parents rather than of my kids, mm. it will never be able to modernize. Our offering is that let's change. I want to build the most capable, competent, future-focused state. Why, why politics? You know, I'm listening to you and some of these ideas are the ideas that come from the tech guys. I mean, blockchain, cryptos, technology. Someone would be like, but Musi sounds like he's ready for the private sector to come up with all these solutions. And if not pitch them to government, then begin running them as pilots and then have people buy into a point where government is forced to give you these, please solve these problems for us because you've solved the problem for rape kits. You've solved the problem for education. You've solved the issue with home affairs and maybe the legal system. Everyone is, seems to be using your thing. So Modi, the prime minister of India, was in country at the moment for BRICS. You look at the reforms that India is doing. In fact, most people no longer talk about IT. They now talk about Indian technology. Wow. When you look at how they manage their payment portals in India, unbelievable, led by a government that now understands what world it's going into. Mm. Indian identity, if I, if I get the stat correct, 90% of people can have IDs now on their smartphones. Let's think about Kenya as a country and look at payment processes like Mpesa and mm. so many others. When I look at my very good friend, Hakiende Hichilema, the president of Zambia, and how he's went, gone ahead and modernized the state in Zambia and fighting for these things. Some, I was in the private sector, so I get it. But man, 
the difficulty is that I want to make these technologies available for all South Africans. So even during COVID, we started a blended learning center so that we can give young people maths lessons by using technology. What's what's blended learning, sorry? So in other words, uh, you need a facilitator in the classroom, so that's real life teaching, but you also incorporate technology so that they can use their mobile phones and there's a balance between the okay. two. Other people talk about digital education. I don't think exclusively that's going to solve our problems. Okay. We need still the physical teacher in the class facilitating the issue. So we started to work with that. And I want to make it possible for all kids in this country. I'm passionate about education. You are. But let alone any of that, Along with being future focused, let's not forget that there are certain things that we still need to catch up on. So I'll use a very serious example. When you look at a child, right? Um, So let's, let's, let's strip a pipeline for a child. Once a woman falls pregnant, we don't have a maternal grant of any kind. In levels in our country where just over 50% of our citizens are living below the upper poverty line, Often what happens is that the female thinks to themselves, well, I can't, I don't, I myself don't have to eat. And they think their child doesn't have to eat, Mm. which is the worst way you can have a child develop um, in in the womb. And therefore, you end up with a scenario where a significant proportion, if I'm not mistaken, just over 20% of our kids are often stunted in their development. Mm. So why can't we introduce a way that says that, particularly for pregnant women, they can come into a community that supports them, but we offer them some some incentives so that they at least have a voucher system that can help them buy basic foods for the child. Mm. You know, one of the most stolen products in this country, if you ask the retailers what is stolen, they will tell you it's formula. I've seen, I've seen the formula things. We used to have yeah. musical things that beep. I've seen sometimes sure. the formula. Sometimes they just put an empty can. Correct. And you only get it when you've paid. Correct. So, so that tells you how, at pain, and this is something that countries that are focused on development of human capability, like, you know, have an office of the rights of children. We've got one, but there are policies that focus on development of children. The first thousand days of a child's lives are vital. How we deal with ECD centers is absolutely crucial. Early childhood development. Yeah, it's crucial in how we develop curriculum. Why those things matter? Because they affect 100% of the population. And yes, we can all sit here and be fees must fall at university. Fair enough. Mm. But let's dare never forget the fact that we've got to get the foundations right so that the throughput of children who start school been able to get towards matric is not 50%, but we can increase it further than that. Mm-hmm. So that more children will start school, finish school. So that when we then pick as to who can go to university and do other things and who can go to colleges and learn internships, they can work that out. And I want to introduce a voucher system for even parents to be able to choose where their child goes to school. So these are policy positions. To choose whether they go to school. To choose. So for example, at this point in time, our government tells us that you've got feeder area policy, okay? Which means that if you are born in a poor neighborhood with Mm -hmm. a poor school, that's the school available to you. Yeah. Now we spend, let's take take an arbitrary number for ease of mathematics. Mm. Let's say a good school, which are not only X model C, but some of the part private schools, we can charge about 30,000. What I'm proposing is, through a jobs and justice fund, which I want to initiate in this country, is to say, let's take a voucher and give it to a parent. Let's call that voucher maybe 10 grand. The state already spends 13,000 per child per learn per year. Mm. So now we have already somewhere there. And then ask the parent to be able to say, now you've got a high quality education and all you need to pay is 700 rands a month to Mm. cover the balance or 600 rands. Suddenly what we've got is charter schooling and different countries have come up with different models for them that is now set up to give quality education and an exercise of choice for those young people. So to me, we revolutionize education because I must say this, I happen to believe that Fervut would be proud of what this government is achieving as it pertains to education. Mm. We've prioritized access, 
But what we failed to do is achieve a meaningful, impactful education for South African citizens. We have to, have to invest into that. So whilst people might be hearing me saying, I've given you an economic offer, I also do believe in much of the education space. And we've got to talk about crime solutions, healthcare, so that we build a country that works. Because if we don't have a country that works, then those private initiatives are not going to be developed from here. I, I may not like Elon Musk, mm. right? Wh why not? <laughs> some, some of the things he says, man, worry okay. me a little bit. Okay. But, but let's not deny, here's a South African who's doing something unbelievable in the world. Yeah. How is it that given Elon Musk, are we not creating better partnerships of getting some of the tech that he's developed? Why with deposits of palladium in this continent, are we not the battery hub of the world? Instead, what's happening is that we're allowing people to illegally mine it. Some of some people using their hands, they sell it to Apple. Apple make cell phones, they sell them back to us as Africans. And now we're paying a premium mm -hmm. for something that was homegrown. Why can't we create battery centers in this continent? Why, 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 why? We need leadership that is future focused. I'm tired of living in a continent where the median age is 23, but we've got leaders who, who can't, for some of them, haven't figured out what the future of this continent must look like. Mm. I, I, my admiration of people like Nelson Mandela is that they dreamt of non-racialism when it was hard and fought against. Yeah. But they were visionaries. What we cannot do is have leaders today who are focused on looking at the rearview mirror rather than being future focused. I think that's the demise we're first suffering from as South Africans. A lot of really great ideas. And you speak charter schools, you speak technology in, in crime. A lot of people are still very far from that. My question was around smaller parties. And you said, it's not about, it's not about small parties, it's about old versus new. Which for me, I think would answer me in saying a lot of them are not necessarily relevant if they're still holding on to old ideas. Have you identified any parties or individuals that seem to be future focused? I know there's a there's a new party called Arise Mzanzi, I think. Mm. Sandy Leshe is in poor. Dutuzane Zuma seems to speak about the future. He's got friends in Dubai and the Middle East that speak about blockchain and those things. Yeah, yeah. Have you mentioned some of these people? Would you be willing to work with some of them if they tick some of the boxes that you're Absolutely. looking for? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and when we set up Build One South Africa, we wanted to align with as many South Africans who share those values and are future focused in that regard. Yeah. So, absolutely. I'm, 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 not, I'm not driven by saying this is my thing or whatever. I'm driven by country. Yeah. That's why I'm, despite... Everything people say to me, what you, you are you are you bitter about this party or that party? <laughs> come on, we're, we're bigger than that, man. Come on, yeah. let's 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 rise above it and let's let's really. So there are individuals. It's, it's not just political parties, by the way. I think yeah. there's a lot of great people in the civil service who share some of these ideas. Sure. I, I I often people say, oh, but our state is is weak and all of that. Yeah, it's weak because it's got some. Poor leadership at maybe sometimes at the top at DG and all of that. Yeah. But there are actually home affairs officials who wake up every day and do a decent day's job. There are, in fact, nurses who do well at hospitals. There are teachers who give a full day's job and That's do correct. their best. So let's not, let's give them the tools, partner with them to develop. And those people we must also have a conversation with because we cannot deny that I think some of our unions are archaic. We need to mobilize, modernize even within that space because yeah. once we've mo modernized, what does the new union environment look like? It's a union that maybe sits as Germany was able to bring on the table, a union that sits in the boardroom and understands the issues. We can't always have a winter season where there's a crippling labor strikes that occur. Mm -hmm. So those issues must be attended to. It's also in, 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 in civil society where you get a lot of NGOs and, and people who are doing some incredible work, by the mm. way. How do we partner with those people in advancing, for example, how do you protect the rights of people? How do you fight for, 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 for various issues, whether it's transparency, equal education? So there are many people in that space that we must also engage because mm. leadership can never be reduced to just political leadership. It must be leadership of society. Yes. That, that's real politics, by the way. The yeah. governing of... 
which doesn't only have to be through this one channel. Correct. So you've got to you've got to be able to do that, and and I think that what we will also discover is that there are pockets of leadership that exist in various sectors that maybe we haven't tapped into and given enough credit to in society that we need to acknowledge and build with. And I want to invite, abuse this platform. I want to talk about business leaders. I think that sometimes, you know, there's a famous saying that says, business has never found a government it does not like. <laughs> and that was true during apartheid. It's sometimes true today. Correct. Let's not suck ourselves into believing that the devil we know. You know, the people who say that statement, mm. Amar, people vote the same way because they say the devil we know is better. Yes. I think business has trapped into the devil we know nonsense forever. They mm. are the, the architects sometimes of it. Mm. And so they become muted in the face of load shedding, in the face of uh, certain regulation that works against them. They become muted, but they're happy to do backroom deals here and there. Sure. <laughs> I'm asking them to be courageous enough, help us register more people to go vote, use your resources to make sure good ideas are contested for, mm. uh, and make sure that let's build a contribution that actually builds South Africa. Because for us to be caught up in, I, no, let's keep these ones. I think sometimes some people keep these ones because they know these ones, let them do whatever they want to do. Correct. And I, I think I've got a million questions, but I, I know you're pressed for time. Uh, we already have like 10 minutes left, by yeah, the way. Yeah, let's keep going. Um, do you believe in democracy? I ask this because a lot of your ideas to a person like myself are quite intelligent. You speak about our issues with education and schooling. And one of my biases is believing that people who are politically illiterate should not be allowed to vote because it's like giving a five-year-old a loaded gun. So I'm asking in the context of South African, maybe the African continent, a lot of people don't really know what they're voting for. And that's why they captured with t-shirts and a streetwise too. Do you believe in democracy that everyone should get to vote? Do you think that's responsible as someone who maybe is a visionary and might see better for the people than themselves? I, I, I think when you... The issue of, firstly, I reject notionally that there should be some form of qualification for voting. I, I think that once you are 18, there is something in you that allows you to know, to make choices about who to vote for. Now, I, I think sometimes there's a, there's a great book written by Drew Weston that speaks about the political brain. And we forget why people actually exercise their right to vote. You know, the metric that people use to vote is to go, does this person represent someone like me? Can they be trusted? And can they be trusted on the issues I care about? And I think voters exercise that choice. So before we talk streetwise to all of that, I sometimes do think that amongst South Africans in general, no one all over the world goes to exercise their voter choice on the back of, I've read this policy, I've done this. They use that prism. Yeah. And then they need to know, but can I trust this leader? Yeah. Can this person fight for someone who is like me and will they, South Africa has a genuine broad issue about dignity. Dignity in this country is still something that we watched under apartheid being stripped away from people. Yeah. And it's a dignity now that citizens are very precious about to protect. So sometimes I think the political alternatives that sometimes get presented before people, people think, Am I going to throw away my dignity here? Mm. And that, I think, is the fear before we even get into the streetwise or anything sure. like that. So the job we've got to do is to take the policy framework that I've just laid out yeah. to furthermore then say, actually, when I sit with a citizen on the street, if I borrow from President Trump, if President Trump says, let's make America great again, Mine is to say, let's build a working South Africa, mm. right? When he says, let's build a wall, lock it up, drain the swamp, mine is, 
let's put a job in every home because actually most citizens, regardless of where they are, are desperate for work. Yeah. Secondly, let's educate, educate, educate because whether you're a father or a mother, rich or poor, educated yourself or not educated yourself. You know, you know, one of the things that have inspired me about my own mother, my mother started her matric, started to do her high school after I'd finished mine. So, did my mother, if you put it to her, ah, do you want to revolutionize education through vouchers? To, no, no, no. But she herself knew better that because she didn't have education, she mm. would pay for mine at a very heavy expense to her. Yeah. So even though she was denied that education, she had the sense enough to know, but this one must go to school. Mm. So to me, I think people have an unbelievable ability to make choices given how we rationalize and identify with South Africans. And you're not going to identify with 100% of all South Africans. And then the last thing I would say, beyond educate, 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 is to say, we all fear crime, man. Let's keep South Africans safe. Mm. Let's figure that out. And prioritize murder. Mm. You kill someone in this country, we've got to deal with you in the harshest way possible. The book by Drew Weston is called The Political Brain. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then I don't know if you still want to address the cameras. Ah, no, 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 we can. Yeah, let's let's get that last question. Yeah. And then you'll address the cameras? No, I'm just asking if you still want to address the people. Yeah, we can, we can. Okay, I'm gonna that, that's going to be the closing for us. My last question is, um, how's your family doing? How are you doing? How's fatherhood uh, how's life uh, in Bossa? Just how how are you doing generally? I feel free, you know. I feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Get out! Uh, Jeez, you felt imprisoned at some point. Uh, I feel <laughs> I feel happy. I am. Um, uh, my wife and I just celebrated eighteen years of marriage. Congrats! <laughs> That's huge. That's huge. Congrats. Um, so I'm I'm grateful that um, she's put up with me for eighteen yes. years. Yes, strong woman. Uh, <laughs> I've got incredible kids. My my daughter is now in that age where she's just about to turn thirteen. So she she uses her eyes to call me to order. <laughs> I can feel it. Uh, my son is playing good football and um, doing well. And our little one just keeps giving me joy. Um, yeah. And so we're, we're a happy family. We are- You're blessed. Yeah. And and you know what? Um, we're grateful to be able to work in this country and serve the country. I think all of us, maybe I speak for my wife a little bit. Mm. She has- Recognizing that Build One South Africa is something that she carries in herself. I think she's much more invested in the project than maybe any other yeah. thing I've done before. So let's work together to do it. And so whenever I'm away from home, which is often, you know, I sometimes think, how many nights am I going to sleep at home this yeah. time? And that's hard. But I, I counted that if you were to phone any of my kids or wife or anything, they would tell you straight up... Um, we want to build this country and we'll give our lives towards it. Yeah. Uh, you are right, you know. And I, and I don't do this because, you know, like other people say, I couldn't be doing other things. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you could be doing other things, go do other things. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just good. But um, I'm, I'm grateful that we get to give expression to the things we care about in this country. And, and if I could... I, yeah, if I could spend my whole life fighting for this country, I think it's a it's a worthwhile, it's a life well lived. You're going to close off just now. I just want to say um, I've got so many things I wanted to discuss. Interracial relationships, Barack Obama, who you've been linked to in the past, a deep dive into education because I know exactly how passionate you are about it. Um, we didn't speak about the African National Congress, the ANC, uh, your thoughts on Cyril Ramaphosa, we didn't speak about load shedding, uh, which mm. is a pain point, especially going into the elections. Um, speaking about the elections, we didn't speak about independent candidates. Mm. We didn't speak about using technology to vote in the future. I'm raising these things just as bookmarks if we do get to sit or maybe in other platforms that they, they get raised. 
Um, I'm going to close off officially and thank you. But if you may, please feel free to address the people. No, I want to speak to young people. I want to speak to that generation of South Africans who say, my vote doesn't matter. Next year is an incredibly significant election. It's probably one of the more important elections we've ever faced up to. Your vote counts as much as anyone else's in this country. There are no Premier League votes. There are no bronze gold, bronze votes or gold votes. All votes count one on one. And we don't have a spare South Africa. So my ask to you is this, is that actually many people in this country have lived through 30 years of this government and have lived maybe in some instances 30 years of apartheid. This is a moment we can transition and move away from some of his, both those systems. So my invitation to you is that if you genuinely buy into the idea that together we are better, that we can fix the injustices of the past, we can put a job in every household and educate people and keep South Africans safe, I'm going to be unashamedly and say, you need to vote and you need to vote for BOSA and you need to ensure that you register to vote and you need to more than anything mobilize your friends and your communities. This is our time. This is our moment. And I know for a fact this country deserves you. And so let's not leave politics to politicians. It's much more important than that. Watch. Thank you so much. And I look forward to our sit down again soon. So that was first half, as they say. No, definitely. Tinama Maybe it was still a warm up because I think you can go, boy. Maybe for like three, four hours. But thank you so much. A lot to think about. Very stimulating. A few more points were Vusi Tembiwai spoke about leaving this country and waiting for it to fail. A lot of the ideas you have that are futuristic would make me ask, why are you not leaving? And um, yeah, one of the other things is the concept of selling out what it means, what it, what, what the future of a South African looks like. You speak about the character. We're still stuck with race. We're still mm. stuck in a lot of things. And it's like, you spoke about visualizing what does a future South African sure. look like so that a human being was like, I like that. I'm going to work towards being that. And then the the concept of being a true non-racialist, like a Springbok rugby player to say, look, we look different. We come from different backgrounds, but how many of us are there realistically and how can we identify? Because I feel we are a serious minority, but I think we can get very loud. Yeah, and yeah. I think if we get loud enough and we win certain global championships, what that means is we're winning in sports, we're winning maybe in certain tech, where, where people are like, those people are dope. I want to identify with those people. Like those are the people that are actually the identity of a future South Africa. No, completely. And part of it is about refining what does it mean to be a South African? Yeah. Right. Like I think we federated what it means to be a South African. We almost firstly black South African, white South African. Yeah. That's our first point. I also do think, and maybe I didn't touch on this, but I think we are exiled from our sense of self. Mm. And that's mean part of the frustration sometimes when you inside institutions that are white, whether those are corporates or those are political parties, is that you feel the compelled need to exile yourself from your sense yeah. of self. The minority of people in this country speak English, but all our politics are conducted in English. 100%. So part of it is giving back the agency and the confidence to say, let's reclaim who we are. Because mm. when we do that, maybe in some ways I've been partly influenced by people like Steve Biko, recognize that black is beautiful and there's something in it that needs to be owned. Mm. And I think when we own that as South Africans, and confident about the language of our dreams, we can then walk into rooms with agency rather than feeling like we need to figure out ways to assimilate within those spaces or not contribute in the way that we are. And I think we've bastardized what it means to be African. Mm. We've made it synonymous with late coming and loudness and all of those attributes, but we forget other features like how compassionate, how generous, how we view health, how we we are innovative, creative, you know, creative, how we forget the fact that, you know, I always joke and say 
people call me up say my daughter's she doesn't really like swimming but she's a really good swimmer and then whenever people look at me they say your child is swimming at Aungpe <laughs> look at me do you genuinely think my child would be a swimmer right but but we forget the fact that who were those people when and I'm not going into the politics of uh, Dutch colonialism or any of the above but I'm almost sure when those sh- ships landed here mm. there were South Africans who were swimming to help those people get on shore 100%. those those were so swimming is not a foreign thing to us but yes. we've made it such um and farming for example when i think about the eastern cape as an agricultural hub there were many black farmers who were unbelievable at farming and know what they were doing so we've now made it bure like it's an afrikaans thing and we forget the fact that we had it within us so i think we've got to restore a sense of self and yeah. and maybe that's something we can learn not only from afrikaans south africans because they own that sense they do we can by also been able to go how confident can we be able to build universities why is there only a few phd's done in native languages you know these are questions that we need to when we think about heritage day coming up now on the 24th and say the heritage we want to hand over to future generations can't just be how closer to white you can be but mm. rather how african you can own yourself and that's a mission for black and white and that's a mission of building what does it mean to be a south african When we discuss Cyril, I want us to speak about ex-president Jacob Zuma and the 24th of September 23rd 24th is actually the official Southern African New Year and when spring fully kicks in. Anyways, Musi, thank you so much for coming through. Always my brother and I look forward to our round two. Cheers. Cheers. Like banana banana, let's get to the second round. 1735. Ah, we did well. <laughs>